द ह्यूमन आई एंड द कलरफुल वर्ल्ड द ह्यूमन आई यूज इज लाइट एंड एनेबल्स आस टू सी ऑब्जेक्ट्स अराउंड आस इट हैज अ लेंस इन इट स्ट्रक्चर वॉट इज द फंक्शन ऑफ द लेंस इन अूमन आई हाउ डी द लेंस इज यूज इन स्पेक्टिकल्स करेक्ट दी फेक्स ऑफ विजन लेट एस कंसिडर दीज क्वेश्चन इन दिस चैप्टर we have learned in the previous chapter about light and some of its properties in this chapter we shall use these ideas to study some of the optical phenomena in nature we shall also discuss about rainbow formation splitting of white light and blue color of the sky the human eye let's begin The human eye is one of the most valuable and sensitive sense organs. It enables us to see the wonderful world and the colors around us. On closing the eyes, we can identify objects to some extent by their smell, taste, sound they make or by touch. It is however impossible to identify colors while closing the eyes. Thus, of all the sense organs, The human eye is the most significant one as it enables us to see the beautiful colorful world around us. The human eye is like a camera. Its lens system forms an image on a light sensitive screen called the retina. Light enters the eye through a thin membrane called cornea. it forms the transparent bulge on the front surface of the eyeball as shown here the eyeball is approximately spherical in shape with a diameter of about 2.3 cm most of the refraction for the light rays entering the eye occurs at the outer surface of the cornea the crystalline lens merely provides the finer adjustment of focal length required to focus objects at different distances on the retina we find a structure called iris behind the cornea iris is a dark muscular diaphragm that controls the size of the pupil the pupil regulates and controls the amount of light entering the eye The eye lens forms an inverted real image of the object on the retina. The retina is a delicate membrane having enormous number of light sensitive cells. The light sensitive cells get activated upon illumination and generate electrical signals. These signals are sent to the brain via the optic nerves. The brain interprets these signals and finally processes the information so that we perceive objects as they are. Power of accommodation. The eye lens is composed of a fibrous jelly-like material. Its curvature can be modified to some extent by the ciliary muscles. The change in the curvature of the eye lens can thus change its focal length. When the muscles are relaxed, the lens becomes thin. Thus, its focal length increases. This enables us to see distant objects clearly. When you are looking at the objects closer to the eye, the ciliary muscles contract. This increases the curvature of the eye lens. the eye lens then becomes thicker consequently the focal length of the eye lens decreases this enables us to see nearby objects clearly the ability of the eye lens to adjust its focal length is called accommodation however the focal length of the eye lens cannot be decreased below a certain minimum limit Try to read a printed page by holding it very close to your eyes. You may see the image being blurred or feel strain in the eye. To see an object comfortably and distinctly, you must hold it at about 25 cm from the eyes. The minimum distance at which objects can be seen most distinctly without strain is called the least distance of distinct vision. it is also called the near point of the eye 
For a young adult with normal vision, the near point is about 25 cm. The farthest point up to which the eye can see objects clearly is called the far point of the eye. It is infinity for a normal eye. You may note here a normal eye can see objects clearly that are between 25 cm and infinity. Sometimes the crystalline lens of people at old age becomes milky and cloudy. This condition is called cataract. This causes partial or complete loss of vision. It is possible to restore vision through a cataract surgery. Now let's see defects of vision and their correction. Sometimes the eye may gradually lose its power of accommodation. In such conditions, the person cannot see the objects distinctly and comfortably. The vision becomes blurred due to the refractive defects of the eye. There are mainly three common refractive defects of the vision. These are myopia or nearsightedness, hypermetropia or farsightedness, and presbyopia. These defects can be corrected by the use of suitable spherical lenses. We discuss below these defects and their correction. Myopia. It is also known as nearsightedness. A person with myopia can see nearby objects clearly but cannot see distinct objects distinctly. A person with this defect has the far point nearer than infinity. Such a person may see clearly up to a distance of few meters. In a myopic eye, the image of a distant object is formed in front of the retina and not at the retina itself. This defect may arise due to excessive curvature of the eye lens or elongation of the eyeball. This defect can be corrected by using a concave lens of suitable power. As illustrated here, a concave lens of suitable power will bring the image back on the retina and thus the defect is corrected. Next is hypermetropia also known as farsightedness. A person with hypermetropia can see distant objects clearly but cannot see nearby objects distinctly. The near point for the person is farther away from the normal near point that is 25 cm. Such a person has to keep a reading material much beyond 25 cm from the eye for comfortable reading. This is because the light rays from a close by object are focused at a point behind the retina as shown here. This defect arises either because the focal length of the eye lens is too long or the eyeball has become too small. This defect can be corrected by using a convex lens of appropriate power as illustrated here. Eyeglasses with converging lenses provide the additional focusing power required for forming the image on the retina. Next is Presbyopia. The power of accommodation of the eye usually decreases with aging. For most people, the near point gradually recedes away. They find it difficult to see nearby objects comfortably and distinctly without corrective eyeglasses. This defect is called presbyopia. It arises due to the gradual weakening of the ciliary muscles and diminishing flexibility of the eye lens. Sometimes a person may suffer from both myopia and hypermetropia. Such people often require bifocal lenses. A common type of bifocal lenses consists of both concave and convex lenses. The upper portion consists of a concave lens. It facilitates distant vision. The lower part is a convex lens. It facilitates near vision. These days, it is possible to correct the refractive defects with contact lenses or through surgical interventions. Now, if I ask you, 
do you know that our eyes can live even after our death by donating our eyes after we die we can light the life of a blind person about 35 million people in the developing world are blind and most of them can be cured about 4.5 million people with corneal blindness can be cured through the corneal transplantation of donated eyes out of these 4.5 million 60% are children below the age of 12 so if we have got the gift of vision why not pass it on to somebody who does not have it what do we have to keep in mind why when eyes have to be donated eye donors can belong to any age group or sex people use spectacles or those operated for cataract can still donate the eyes people who are diabetic have hypertension asthma patients and those without communicable diseases can also donate eyes eyes must be removed within 4 to 6 hours after death inform the nearest eye bank immediately the eye bank team will remove the eyes at the home of the deceased or at a hospital eye removal takes only 10 to 15 minutes it is a simple process and does not lead to any disfigurement persons who were infected with or died because of aids hepatitis b or hepatitis c rabies acute leukemia tetanus cholera meningitis or encephalitis cannot donate eyes an eye bank collects evaluates and distributes the donated eyes all eyes donated are evaluated using strict medical standards those donated eyes found unsuitable for transplantation are used for valuable research and medical education the identities of both the donor and the recipient remain confidential one pair of eyes give vision to up to four corneal blind people now let's see a few questions human eye and the colorful world question 1 what is meant by power of accommodation of the eye well power of accommodation is the ability of the eye lens to focus near and far objects clearly and where would it focus the objects on the retina and how would it do that well by adjusting its focal length thus power of accommodation is the ability of the eye lens to focus near and far objects clearly on the retina by adjusting its focal length In this process ciliary muscles help in changing the shape of lens by compressing and elongating it However please note that the power of accommodation of the eye is limited It implies that the focal length of the eye lens cannot be reduced beyond certain minimum limit In case you know what that minimum limit is let us know in the comments below Let's see question 2 A person with a myopic eye cannot see objects beyond 1.2 meter distinctly. What should be the type of corrective lens used to restore proper vision? Before we discuss this answer, tell me one thing. In order to view the distances beyond 1.2 meter, what should be the focal length of the lens? Well, of course, it should be 1.2 meter, right? Thus, we know that focal length is 1.2 meter now power is 1 upon f so it will be 1 upon 1.2 thus power is 0.83 diopters so for the person suffering from myopia the corrective lens will be concave or diverging lens with a power of 0.83 diopters question 3 What is the far point and the near point of the human eye with normal vision? Let's first talk about the far point of the eye. It is the farthest point up to which the eye can see objects clearly. It is infinity for a normal eye. 
However, as the name suggests, the minimum distance at which objects can be seen most distinctly without strain is called the near point of the eye. It is also called the least distance of distinct vision. For a young adult with normal vision, the near point is about 25 cm. You may note here that a normal eye can see objects clearly that are between 25 cm and infinity. Question 4. A student has difficulty reading the blackboard while sitting in the last row. What could be the defect the child is suffering from and how can it be corrected? Since the child cannot see the distant objects like blackboard writing, clearly he is suffering from the defect of vision called myopia or short-sightedness. In myopia, an image is formed before the retina. The defect can be corrected by the use of concave or diverging lens of appropriate power. Now, how does a diverging lens help? Well, it helps in forming images at the retina. Let's start with part 2 of Human Eye and the Colorful World. Refraction of Light Through a Prism You've learned how light gets refracted through a rectangular glass slab. For parallel refracting surfaces, as in a glass slab, the emergent ray is parallel to the incident ray. However, it is slightly displaced laterally. How would light get refracted through a transparent prism? Consider a triangular glass prism. It has two triangular bases and three rectangular lateral surfaces. These surfaces are inclined to each other. The angle between the two lateral faces is called the angle of the prism. Let us now do an activity to study the refraction of light through a triangular glass prism. Fix a sheet of white paper on a drawing board using drawing pins. Now place a glass prism on it in such a way that it rests on its triangular base. Trace the outline of the prism using a pencil. Draw a straight line PE inclined to one of the refracting surfaces, say AB of the prism. Fix two pins, say at points P and Q on the line PE as shown here. Look for the images of the pins fixed at point P and Q through the other face AC. Fix two more pins at the points R and S such that pins at R and S are the images of the pins at P and Q lie on the same straight line. Join and reduce the points R and S. Let this line meet the boundary of the prism at F. Now remove the pins and the glass prism. Join E and F. Now draw perpendiculars to the refracting surfaces AB and AC of the prism at points E and F respectively. Mark the angle of incidence as angle I, the angle of refraction as angle R and the angle of emergence as angle E as shown here. Here PE is the incident ray. EF is the refracted ray and FS is the emergent ray. You may note that a ray of light is entering from air to the glass at the first surface AB. The light ray on the refraction has bent towards the normal. At the second surface AC, the light ray has entered from glass to air. Hence, it has bent away from the normal. Now compare the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction at each refracting surface of the prism. Is this similar to the kind of bending that occurs in a glass slab? The peculiar shape of the prism makes the emergent ray bend at an angle to the direction of the incident ray. This angle is called the angle of deviation. In this case, angle D is the angle of deviation. We can mark the angle of deviation in the activity and measure it. Did you find this activity interesting? 
let's move on to our next topic which is dispersion of white light by a glass prism you must have seen and appreciated the spectacular colors in a rainbow how could the white light of the sun give us various colors of the rainbow before we take up this question we shall first go back to the refraction of light through a prism the inclined refracting surfaces of a glass prism show exciting phenomena the angle between its two lateral faces is called the angle of the prism let us now do an activity to study the refraction of light through a triangular glass prism take a thick sheet of cardboard and make a small hole or narrow slit in its middle allow sunlight to fall on the narrow slit this gives a narrow beam of white light now Take a glass prism and allow the light from the slit to fall on one of its faces as shown here. Now turn the prism slowly until the light that comes out of it appears on a nearby screen. What do you observe? You will find a beautiful band of colors. Why does this happen? The prism has probably split the incident white light into a band of colors. Note the colors that appear at the two ends of the color band what is the sequence of colors that you see on the screen the various colors seen are violet indigo blue green yellow orange and red as shown here the acronym vipgur will help you to remember the sequence of colors the band of the colored components of a light beam is called a spectrum you might not be able to see all the colors separately yet something makes each color distinct from the other the splitting of light into its component colors is called dispersion you have seen that white light is dispersed into its seven color components by a prism why do we get these colors different colors of light bend through different angles with respect to the incident ray as they pass through a prism the red light bends the least while the violet the most thus the rays of each color emerge along different paths and thus become distinct it is the band of distinct colors that we see in a spectrum Isaac Newton was the first to use a glass prism to obtain the spectrum of sunlight. He tried to split the colors of the spectrum of white light further by using another similar prism. However, he could not get any more colors. He then placed a second identical prism in an inverted position with respect to the first prism as shown here. This allowed all the colors of the spectrum to pass through the second prism. He found a beam of white light emerging from the other side of the second prism this observation gave newton the idea that the sunlight is made up of seven colors any light that gives a similar spectrum to that of sunlight is often referred to as white light a rainbow is a natural spectrum appearing in the sky after a rain shower it is caused by the dispersion of sunlight by tiny water droplets present in the atmosphere a rainbow is always formed in a direction opposite to that of the sun the water droplets act like small prisms they refract and disperse the incident sunlight then reflect it internally and finally refract it again when it comes out of the raindrop as shown here due to the dispersion of light and internal reflection different colors reach the observer's eye you can also see a rainbow on a sunny day when you look at the sky through a waterfall or through a water fountain with the sun behind you next is atmospheric refraction you might have observed the apparent random wavering or flickering of objects seen through a turbulent stream of hot air rising above a fire or a radiator the air just above the fire becomes hotter than the air further up the hotter air is lighter than the cooler air above it and 
has a refractive index slightly less than that of the cooler air. Since the physical conditions of the refracting medium are not stationary, the apparent position of the object as seen through the hot air fluctuates. This wavering is thus an effect of atmosphere refraction, that is, refraction of light by the Earth's atmosphere on a small scale in our local environment. The twinkling of stars is a similar phenomenon on a much larger scale. Let us see how can we explain. The twinkling of a star is due to atmospheric refraction of starlight. The starlight on entering the Earth's atmosphere undergoes refraction continuously before it reaches the Earth. The atmospheric refraction occurs in a medium of gradually changing refractive index. Since the atmosphere bends starlight towards the normal, the apparent position of the star is slightly different from its actual position. The star appears slightly higher or above than its actual position when viewed near the horizon. Further, this apparent position of the star is not stationary but keeps on changing slightly since the physical conditions of the Earth's atmosphere are not stationary. Since the stars are very distant, they approximate point size sources of light. As the path of rays of the light coming from the star goes on varying slightly, the apparent position of the star fluctuates and the amount of starlight entering the eye flickers. The star sometimes appears brighter and some other time fainter, which is the twinkling effect. Now, if we ask, why don't the planets twinkle? Well, the planets are much closer to the sun and are thus seen as extended sources. If we consider a planet as a collection of a large number of point size sources of light, the total variation in the amount of light entering our eye from all the individual point size sources will average out to zero, thereby nullifying the twinkling effect. Pretty interesting, right? Now let's see advanced sunrise and delayed sunset. The sun is visible to us about two minutes before the actual sunrise and about two minutes after the actual sunset because of atmospheric refraction again. By actual sunrise, we mean the actual crossing of the horizon by the sun. In the figure here, see the actual and apparent positions of the sun with respect to the horizon. The time difference between the actual sunset and the apparent sunset is about two minutes. Also, the apparent flattening of the sun's disk at sunrise and sunset is also due to the same phenomena. Hope you are good till now. Let's now know about scattering of light. The interplay of light with objects around us gives rise to spectacular phenomena in nature. The blue color of the sky, color of water in deep sea. The reddening of the sun at sunrise and the sunset are some of the wonderful phenomena we are familiar with. In the previous class, you have learned about the scattering of light by colloidal particles. The path of a beam of light passing through a true solution is not visible. However, its path becomes visible through a colloidal solution where the size of the particles is relatively larger. Next is Tyndall effect. The Earth's atmosphere is a heterogeneous mixture of minute particles. These particles include smoke, tiny water droplets, suspended particles of dust and molecules of air. When a beam of light strikes such fine particles, the path of the beam becomes visible. The light reaches us after being reflected diffusely by these particles. The phenomenon of scattering of light by the colloidal particles gives rise to Tyndall effect, which we have studied in class 9. This phenomena is seen when a fine beam of sunlight enters a smoke-filled room through a small hole. Thus, scattering of light makes the particles visible. Tyndall effect can also be observed when sunlight passes through a canopy of a dense forest. Here, Tiny water droplets in the mist scatter light. The 
color of the scattered light depends on the size of the scattering particles. Very fine particles scatter mainly blue light, while particles of large size scatter light of longer wavelengths. If the size of the scattering particles is large enough, then scattered light may even appear white. Pretty interesting, right? Now let's move on to our last topic from this chapter, which is why is the color of the sky blue? The molecules of air and other fine particles in the atmosphere have size smaller than the wavelength of visible light. These are more effective in scattering light of shorter wavelengths at the blue end than that of longer wavelengths at the red end. The red light has a wavelength of about 1.8 times greater than that of blue light. Thus, when sunlight passes through the atmosphere, the fine particles in the air scatter the blue color more than the strongly blue color more strongly than the red color. The scattered blue light enters our eyes. If the earth had no atmosphere, there would not have been any scattering. Then the sky would have looked dark. The sky appears dark to passengers flying at very high altitudes as scattering is not prominent at such heights. You might have observed that danger signal lights are red in color. Do you know why? The red is least scattered by fog or smoke. Therefore, it can be seen in the same color at a distance. I hope you've understood the chapter well. Let's attempt a few questions now. The human eye can focus on objects at different distances by adjusting the focal length of the eye lens. This is due to accommodation, the power of accommodation of our eye. Question 2. The human eye forms the image of an object at its retina. The least distance of distinct vision for a young adult with normal vision is about 25 cm. The change in focal length of an eye lens is caused by the action of the ciliary muscles. Let's see question 5. A person needs a lens of power minus 5.5 diopters for correcting his distant vision. However, for correcting his near vision, he needs a lens of power plus 1.5 diopter. What is the focal length of the lens required for correcting distant vision and near vision? We are given that power of the lens used for correcting distant vision is minus 5.5 diopters and that for correcting near vision is plus 1.5 diopters. We know that the focal length of the lens is 1 by p. Hence, focal length of the lens required for correcting distant vision would be 1 upon minus 5.5 which is minus 0.182 meters and that for correcting near vision is 1 upon 1.5 which is 0.667 meters. Question 6. The far point of a myopic person is 80 centimeter in front of the eye. What is the nature and power of the lens required to correct the problem? Well, for a myopic person, concave lens is used to correct the problem. Focal length is equal to distance of far point from the eye. Hence, F is minus 80 centimeter, that is 0 0.8 meters negative. Power of lens is 1 upon F, so it will be 1 upon minus 0 0.8, which is minus 1.25 diopters. Question 7. Make a diagram to show how hypermetropia is corrected. Also, there is a case. The near point of a hypermetropic eye is 1 meter. What is the power of the lens required to correct this defect? Assume that the near point of the normal eye is 25 centimeter. Now, let's see the solution. Hypermetropia is also known as farsightedness. A person with hypermetropia can see distant objects clearly but cannot see nearby objects distinctly. The near point for the person is farther away from the normal near point of 25 cm. 
such a person has to keep a reading material much beyond 25 cm from the eye for comfortable reading. This is because the light rays from a close by object are focused at a point behind the retina as shown here. This defect arises either because the focal length of the eye lens is too long or the eyeball has become too small. This defect can be corrected by using a convex lens of appropriate power. The convex lens actually creates a virtual image of a nearby object n dash in this figure at the near point of vision which is n of the person suffering from hypermetropia. This is the diagram that we were looking for. Coming back to the question, we are given that the near point of a hypermetropic eye is 1 meter. The given person will be able to clearly see the object kept at 25 centimeter if the image of the object is formed at its near point which is given as 1 meter. Now object distance is u which is 25 centimeter negative. Image distance is v which is 1 meter or 100 centimeter negative again. Using the lens formula, we get 1 by u, 1 by v minus 1 by u is 1 by f. So 1 by minus 100 minus 1 upon minus 25 is 1 upon f. That means minus 1 by 100 plus 1 by 25 is 1 by f. So 1 by f is 3 by 100. That means f is 100 by 3 centimeter which means f is 1 by 3 meters now power is 1 by f so power is 3 diopters question 8 why is a normal eye not able to see clearly the objects placed closer than 25 centimeter a normal eye is unable to clearly see the objects placed closer than 25 centimeter because the ciliary muscles of eyes are unable to contract beyond a certain limit. Question 9. What happens to the image distance in the eye when we increase the distance of an object from the eye? Even when we increase the distance of an object from the eye, the image is still formed on the retina, right? For this, eye lens becomes thinner and its focal length increases as the object is moved away from the eye. Question 10. Why do stars twinkle? When a ray of light travels from one medium to another, it bends. This phenomena is referred to as refraction. If it travels from a rare medium to a dense medium, it bends towards the normal. And if it travels from a dense medium to a rarer medium, it bends away from the normal. The speed at which the light travels changes depending on the medium and therefore this bending occurs. This effect can be observed when light passes through a prism or a glass slab or even when light passes through water. The light ray travels from air to a medium of different densities here. So, how are refraction and twinkling connected? The atmosphere of Earth is made of different layers. It is affected by winds, temperatures and densities. When light from a distant source, a star in our case, passes through turbulent atmosphere of the Earth, it undergoes refraction many times. With continuous bending and rebending of light, we perceive them to twinkle. Hence, stars do not actually twinkle, they just appear to be twinkling. Question 11. Why don't the planets twinkle? Well, the planets are much closer to the Earth. Thus, they are seen as extended sources. If we consider a planet as a collection of a large number of point-sized sources of light, 
the total variation in the amount of light entering our eye from all the individual point size sources will average out to zero, thereby nullifying the twinkling effect. Question 12. Why does the sky appear dark instead of blue to an astronaut? The blue color of the sky is due to scattering of light from the atmosphere. As there is no atmosphere in space and hence light does not scatter into its constituent colors, that is why the sky appears dark instead of blue to an astronaut in space. With this, we come to an end of this wonderful chapter. If you like the video, consider liking, sharing and subscribing for more. Have a good day. Bye-bye.